Hey, this is Dr. Ben White, host of the Rational Wellness Podcast. I talk to the leading health and nutrition experts and researchers in the field to bring you the latest in cutting edge health information. Subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast for weekly updates. And to learn more, check out my website, drwhites.com. Thanks for joining me and let's jump into the podcast. Hello, Rational Wellness Podcasters. Our topic for today is probiotics and SIBO with Dr. Jason Harrowick. SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, is believed to be the most common cause of irritable bowel syndrome, or IBS, and SIBO is a condition of too many bacteria in the small intestine. Now, why would you want to uh, treat it by ingesting more bacteria when you already have too many? (laughs) But some studies do show that taking probiotics are helpful for both IBS and SIBO. And while some studies show that specific strains, such as Bifidobacterium infantis strain 35624, helps with IBS, other studies and meta-analyses just lump various probiotics and often of unspecified strains or mixtures uh, together. This has created somewhat of a mishmash of research confusion. Um, I've talked to Dr. Mark Pimentel about probiotics for SIBO, and he basically dismissed it partially because how can you talk about a group of uh, substances? It would be like saying antibiotics, you know, are good for a certain condition. So saying probiotics are good for SIBO. It, you know, from a scientific perspective, really doesn't seem to make much sense. Now, there's one prominent doctor in the SIBO world who recommends taking triple probiotic therapy, taking a lacto bifido blend of unspecified strains, a Saccharomyces boulardii product, and a spore based probiotic for patients with SIBO. And he says that specific strains don't matter, just take one from each category. Um, Some functional medicine practitioners have concluded that the best type of probiotic for patients with SIBO is to take a spore-based probiotic since it won't open up until it gets into the colon and therefore will not add to the bacteria in the small intestine. On the other hand, many functional medicine practitioners in the SIBO space uh, do not recommend taking probiotics while treating SIBO until after you've reduced the number of bacteria with appropriate antibiotics or herbal antimicrobials. And of course, this would make sense based on the 4R or 5R strategy pioneered by the father of functional medicine, Dr. Jeffrey Bland, who taught us to remove, then replace then re-inoculate and finally repair the gut. And so there you would only use probiotics in, in phase three, the re-inoculate phase. So who better to help us understand this confusion about probiotics for patients with IBS or SIBO than Dr. Jason Harrelick, joining us from Australia. Dr. Jason Harrelick is a researcher, lecturer, naturopath, and nutritionist with over 20 years of clinical experience with focus on the treatment of gastrointestinal conditions. He's the head of research at probioticadvisor.com, which is an incredible database of information about probiotics. And he also offers a series of courses that are available uh, adjacent to that program as well. Uh, Dr. Harrelick completed his PhD examining the capacity of probiotics, prebiotics, and herbal medicines to modify the GI tract. He teaches and lectures on probiotics and the microbiome all over the world. He's written many papers and over 20 textbook chapters. Dr. Jason Harrelick, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, you're very welcome, Ben. I'm glad to be here chatting with thank you, you again about but. Very interesting and and apparently controversial topic. So we'll be delving into. Yeah. So uh, why don't we start by talking about SIBO and IBS? And um, uh, so let's focus in on SIBO, which um, a lot of the data seems to show is the most common cause of IBS, probably accounting for 60, maybe as much as 70 or more percent, depending upon how we're able to determine if you have SIBO. 
And the way we generally determine if you have SIBO is with a SIBO breath test. And uh, I'd like you to comment about the SIBO breath test and especially about the various substrates that are available that are used in the test, including lactulose, glucose, fructose. Gosh, I don't know where to start even. <laughs> <laughs> so well, maybe um, maybe I'll like, I'll take a, a step back and get listen. Yeah. My PhD was specifically around dysbiosis and irritable bowel syndrome. Okay. And we were running clinical studies in IBS, um, giving them prebiotics and probiotics and, and herbs to try to influence their microbiome. This was back, I started my PhD and my honors degree, which photo my PhD in, in the year 2000. So before people were talking about SIBO as being anything but this really rare condition. Um, and so I had a chance to do like this lovely literature review into irritable bowel syndrome and probiotics and go look back, you know, and found the first study is going back to the 1950s showing probiotics were successful in treating IBS. And a num- you know, not every single strain is obviously, but the, the, the bulk of, of data suggests that probiotics are helpful for treatment of IBS. Right. That, that was clear in the early 2000s when this idea of SIBO came out of, of you know, um, so for me, and then as, then SIBO came out as, as the cause of IBS. And I'm like, well, if SIBO is the cause of IBS and we've got like 50 years of research showing that probiotics successfully treat IBS, then why on earth wouldn't we be using probiotics to treat this when we already have 50 years of data showing that apparently it treat it successfully treats the this condition, you know, so th- that's kind of where my background was from, where people were like, oh, don't use probiotics. But it's like, if you're, if you're saying this is the cause of IBS, and we've got all this data showing probiotics work in IBS, it just doesn't make sense that we say we should not take probiotics. But it's this. counterintuitive. If the problem is too many bacteria, why are you going to put more bacteria in? I think it's counterintuitive for if, you, if that's like the, the big viewpoint, rather than, okay, it's actually not just too many bacteria, it's too many problematic bacteria, right. um, or it's too many streptococci, or too many uh, E. coli, or Klebsiella that are there. And, and when you understand that differently, um, that changes things. Because it's like, okay, because I think that conception around SIBO is, is changing. And in fact, there's, there's more of a thinking now that it's, it's more about dysbiosis than it is about just overgrowth of, of bacteria. And you could have overgrowth of some bacteria and never have an issue with it. And you have overgrowth of Klebsiella, or E. coli, or streptococci, and you get symptoms associated with it. Um, and, and potentially gut damage to um, in the small bowel. So I think under the, on, with, with that understanding, it's like, okay, well, what, what do we know that probiotics can do? I, I think there's this misconception, and this goes back probably to the, the 4R, 5R type stuff with re-inoculation. You can't re-inoculate with probiotics. Like, like this is an old myth that we should really make sure we, 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 we toss out. And certainly I teach within the uh, functional medicine program at University of Western States, and we we changed that re-inoculate to restore. <laughs> It's like can't with the new century. Like we we can't re-inoculate with with lactobacillus and bifidobacteria and, and product supplements. It's not reality. We can help restore populations that are that are too low. But it gets into that idea of of colonization. Yeah. So I think the idea that oh we've got more bacteria, we just add more and then they just permanently live there. That's not reality. That's not what happens with when we take lactobacillus or, or bifidobacteria or saccharomyces or et cetera. They do not permanently live in your, your small bowel or large bowel. You know, they're temporary visitors, so they're passing through. But while they pass through, they may well secrete some bacterial sins or other antimicrobial compounds that reduce levels of pathogens. They might just secrete short-chain fatty acids or lactic acid, which changes the environment, which reduces levels of pathogenic bacteria. Some probiotic strains can stimulate the migrating motor complex and help with motility, which is an underlying issue with SIBO. Um, some can certainly help heal up and regenerate small intestinal cells and help the healing process after the sort of arguably the treatment of SIBO. Um, some strains can reduce visceral hypersensitivity, which is one of the core conditions underlying IBS where the nerves are, are hypersensitive to, you know, uh, the sensation of gas or the sensation of feces moving through the colon. Some can decrease inflammation. Some can enhance secretory IgA production. You know, so if we start looking at what the, the possibility of what probiotics can offer here, it makes total sense that we can use them as, as a as a tools to actually help. So, I mean, there's different ways of, of, of reducing or changing bacterial ecosystems. Antibiotics is one way, sure, but probiotics is another way, you know, and, and herbal medicines are other ways of actually changing ecosystem composition. So yeah, would it be think, accurate to say in some cases that probiotics are antimicrobial? Yeah, well, it would be from a SIBO perspective. And I think, again, maybe 20 years ago, it would have been, you know, there was a lack of of research around probiotics in SIBO specifically. Yes, there was the probiotics in IBS. That the data set was all clear around that. There were successful case studies of kids with severe SIBO who were hospitalized 
and antibiotics weren't working where they gave them probiotics and the kids got better and got out of hospital. So there were successful case studies, treatment with probiotics of severe life-threatening SIBO in the 1990s that were published too. So there's already some preliminary data suggested that probiotics would be helpful. But you, you skip forward now and you look at look, look the data out there. There's study after study showing probiotics are helpful for the treatment of, of SIBO. And I think it's, you can't just have your head in the sand and say, this doesn't exist. <laughs> and well, I agree with, with Dr. Pimentel that there are issues with, meta-analyses where you just grab all probiotics and shove them together. It's like saying, let's do meta-analysis of do drugs treat hypertension? Well, <laughs> you know, some do, some don't. But if you show the ones that don't in there with the ones that do, you're going to actually like get an unclear effect. You're not going to see anything. And that's definitely a problem with, with probiotic meta-analyses where researchers are unaware of this fact, will just grab all probiotics and shove it together. And it, listen, some won't work. You know, if your probiotic strain you're giving doesn't have selected antimicrobial properties or won't help with motility, you know, then is it going to work with SIBO? Yeah, pro- perhaps not. Whereas ones that actually do have antimicrobial properties do seem to work for, for SIBO. You know, and, and I think, again, you look at, there's a, a meta-analysis in, I think, 2000. 17, I think it was, where they took all the probiotic studies and for, for SIBO. And I think they found that, again, which had some some issues with methodology, because I think, you know, you're it, grouping all the things together, which, if anything, it includes beneficial effects, makes it harder to see. But even doing that, there is a 53% eradication rate, clearance of SIBO with, with probiotics in the studies when we pulled the data together, you know. Um, and, and since that's, that was published, there's, there's more and more studies published each, each year looking at it. Like not, not like, you know, 50 studies a year, but there's a handful of studies published each year supportive of the use of probiotics to, to treat, effectively treat SIBO, um, and bring down breath gas to whether that be hydrogen or methane or, or both. Now, is the best way to think about this, some people have described it sort of as a parking lot. There's only so many parking spaces. And if you park, the good bacteria in there, there's no parking spaces left for the bad bacteria, almost like if we're having uh, uh, some elaborate game of musical chairs and and the bad bacteria don't end up with chairs if there's enough good bacteria there. That, that's definitely a component there. And and I think the other additional bit is, is whether that microbe can produce something that that is antimicrobial. And I think a good okay. example here is Lactobacillus retry DSM17938, which is sold around the world as BioGaia. All right, there's a clinical trial giving it to kids who are, who are with reflux disease who are given proton pump inhibitors to, to treat the reflux. And we know the PPIs, that is very consistent around this increased risk of SIBO development. So this study was like, okay, what if we give them this probiotic? Will it prevent these kids from getting SIBO? And then they tested a baseline, tested you know three months later. SIBO developed in, I think it was 50... 56% of people in the placebo group, 6% of those in the bio guy group. That's a massive difference, you know, yeah, from a from sure. prevention perspective. Absolutely. But what, what's unique about this strain is this strain produces an antimicrobial substance called reuterin. And it may be that is the key reason why, why it works in that situation. And the dose they're giving is like, you know, 100, 100 million CFU twice daily, I think was the dose. So relatively small. Yet there was another study similar population of kids taking proton pump inhibitors for, you know, their reflux. And they gave a combination of, 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 of lactobacilli and bifidobacteria at much higher doses. It did not work. Yeah. Did not prevent SIBO. And it's like, okay, well, do those specific strains have any indication they would be helpful in this condition as in producing antimicrobial substances, et cetera? No, they don't have that. So, you know, to me, it was like, oh, okay, well, yeah, if we choose our products wisely, we can get therapeutic benefit. And if we just use random off pro- products with no sort of r- good rationale for the use, I think we're going to hit and miss miss more often than we actually hit. Whereas I think when we're actually using stuff that has theoretical rationale for their use, we're going to get better results. And, and and if we as researchers actually choose the ones to have theoretical evidence of, of use to research, we're going to get better outcomes than just grabbing, hey, here's a random probiotic. Let's see if it works for, for SIBO um, prevention versus let's choose one that has the traits and qualities we're after. Um, is it we possible? Do this in probiotic researchers all the time, like they're looking for, how, how do we choose the best probiotic for, for you know, treating vaginal bacterial vaginosis? It's like, let's see the ones that survive, like have the good pH tolerance, produce D-lactic acid, 
inhibit the growth of those pathogens. You know, like you you, t- you might get a hundred strains to start with, and you put them through a bit of an obstacle course, and you come up with like three or four that actually tick all the right boxes, and then you take them into study. You know, from that point onwards, and I think this also illustrates, I think, some differences you. you set initially around do, do strains matter yeah yes yeah, strains do matter you know we can clearly see that in in that kind of research where you can have 20 strains of lactulose crispatus for example and only some will have all the all the criteria that you need to be like a successful genre probiotic yeah and just like we have I have numerous strains of lactulose reutri only some produce reuterin so if you if you're supplement with a strain of, of lactulose reutri that does not produce reuterin you cannot expect it to have the same effect as the ones that do produce reuterin, like the the BioGaia one that was used in that successful um, SIBO case, and that st- same strain been used in, in methane um, cases too, where it actually simply reduced methane um, output and you know, cleared it cleared methane a number of people in that study as well. Oh, interesting, because that was going to be my next question, which is. Can, how specific can we get? Can we uh, take the results of a SIBO breath test, find out the patient has hydrogen SIBO, and we know certain organisms tend to cause that, or is it hydrogen sulfide, or is it methane? And then can, are there are there specific strains that you would recommend for each type of SIBO? Yeah, I mean, I think as more research comes to the fore and we have access to some of those strains, we'll, we'll, we'll get better data around here in this area and again i was you know recently looking at the probiotic SIBO literature and there's a number of studies that have been published out of china where they you know they're they're a bit vague in their description of the probiotics that they use yeah um, compared to other um in, in these studies so, so it's hard to necessarily as a clinician take that into clinical practice going okay well this study this this combination of probiotics worked in this chinese study can i use these strains well they don't delay the strain they tell you the species but so, so as as each year goes on and we get more research, um, we will become better at fine tuning and matching these things up. But but currently, we know that the you know the retry DSM one seven nine three eight is helpful for methane. That that is that is, okay. that is clear. Um, and now, then, now, could you or have you? Is it possible to simply recommend that for a patient with methane SIBO without anything else? Is that yeah. something you've done? How would you treat kids? Oh, yeah, only kids. kids. Okay. Because they can't necessarily take the foul tasting herbs that I would usually use in adults. <laughs> uh, yeah. But um, so so certainly they can work really well on their own in some people. Okay. But I generally I do my best to get the best result as quickly as possible with patients in a way that doesn't harm their, their clonic microbiome in any significant sense. So I'm trying to choose selectively acting antimicrobial herbals. Um, a, a prebiotic like partially hydrolyzed guar gum, and then for, for methane, I, I would use the biogaia, like just for dry as well. Yeah, um, but for some kids who can't do the the herbs, well, I might just use biogaia and, and partially hydrolyzed guar gum. And yes, you can see results in those 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 some of those people with just that simple treatment. And and partially hydrolyzed guar gum, you would pick because uh, unlike. A lot of prebiotics or forms of fiber that tend to feed SIBO bacteria, that has been shown not to exacerbate SIBO symptoms, right? Yeah, it's an interesting, interesting fiber. Um, there, I think we just did a systematic review of this just, just recently, actually, but I think there's nine studies using it for, for irritable bowel syndrome, um, and all of them are positive. You know, so that's what got me excited when I read these studies in IBS. Oh, this goes back to me, 2016, when I first came across it, 2015 or 14, not that long ago. But I, I'm unaware of it before then, do a literature search. I'm like, oh my God, look at this, this substance. I was completely ignorant of, and it's got all these studies showing it not only reduces bloating and distension and normalizes bowel pattern in, these, in patients with IBS and works for constipation problem IBS or diarrhea problem IBS. So we've got that data. And then there are studies using it for showing that it decreases methane, output in people that have high methane. And then we have studies where they gave it alongside rifaximin to treat SIBO. And I think from memory, the eradication rate with partially hydrolyzed guar gum was like 85, 86% versus 60% with dysrefaxin on its own. So it significantly improved the outcome. And this was hydrogen dominant SIBO. So for me, PHDG is integral whether I'm treating hydrogen dominant SIBO or methane. Um, and it is tolerated by most people with SIBO. Not all, there'll still be some that are that react to it, but compared to other you know prebiotic fibers like inulin, FOS, or glycolysaccharides, it, it is definitely better tolerated 
um, from a gas production. And do you, do you tend to use that uh, a couple of times a day and do you tend to use it away from meals or with meals? It doesn't with, matter. With the PHDG, it can be with or without meals. It doesn't matter. Um, and you, generally it's once a day to ease compliance with oh, that. So okay. like six or seven grams, one, one hit. And it, it's, it's easy to work with because you can mix it into, unlike some fibers, it mixes beautifully into cold, cold water and it's got almost no flavor. So you can mix into a cold drink and not, it makes the water a bit thicker, but not really much flavor. Easy to mix into smoothies or easy to add to, you know, you know, breakfast, cereals, porridge, whatever you might actually have. It's easy to, to work with. Do, do you know, um, or can you speculate, what is it about PHGG, partially hydrolyzed guar gum, why it has this different quality from uh, many other forms of fiber or prebiotic? Yeah, it's definitely for most people less gas forming. And I think that's part of it. And and I think we know it also feeds butyrate producing species more so. So if we look at the the what species utilize substances that, that we eat, like if we have inulin phos, yeah, we feed bifidobacteria and, and fecalobacterium, um, acromantia, for example, are three po populations that tend to increase. Where, whereas with partially hydrolyzed guar gum, we don't maybe a little bit of bifidobacteria, but it's often um, it's roseburia and um, acromantia, and other, yeah. other well, not so much acromantia, interesting enough, but it's more of a butyrate producing species. Okay, so it's kind of feeding a different group of bacteria that generally perhaps are not overgrowing in the small bowel. Yeah, um, we don't tend to see butyrate producing species and don't really show up on <laughs> on any of the literature looking at what's growing overgrowing in the small and small bowel and patients with SIBO, it's usually streptococci or um, probiobacteria that show up in the vast majority of, of studies to date. Um, so if they can't utilize that as a food source so much, then um, yeah. But but how exactly to improve the efficacy of rifaximin and its SIBO treatment is, is an interesting thought. And you know the researchers initially were doing it because it is a prebiotic like a substance and they're using it using it that way. We know it does improve efficacy, but the, the mechanism I think is a little, a little bit less clear. Whereas when it comes to methane, I think it's more clear in that we know that um, methane producing bacteria, typically methanobrevibacter smithii is the, the key one for most people, uh, likes living in a more neutral to alkaline pH um, and and kind of doesn't like being bathed in butyrate. So if we ingest a substance that creates more butyrate, we kind of create the conditions that are less conducive to the growth of methane producing bacteria. What, what about just adding butyrate as a supplement in such cases of methane? Yes, yeah. well? you can certainly use that as an adjunct agent too. The 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 thing about um, what what you can sort of have though when you use when you use just um, butyrate is you can have a, a Essentially, taking a step back, you know, what does the methane producing bacteria consume? Methanobacter eats hydrogen gas. Right. So, if you change the circumstance where you just reduce the um, levels of methane producing bacteria, the hydrogen gas level can actually increase. So, sometimes you can actually have ah. worse, worse bloating or distension from giving butyrate, even though if it's it's actually dealing with the underlying um, methane overproduction, but you end up with more hydrogen in the shorter term which can mean more symptoms as well. So I think I have played a bit with that and I think it can be a useful tool. So in some people, essentially what you're be... telling us is anytime you have a patient who has methane SIBO, there may be hydrogen SIBO that's being masked by the fact that the increased number of methanogens are consuming the hydrogen. Yeah, and this is clearly the case if, if it's methane in the small bowel, for sure. Like if you've got, because we're supposed to have of hydrogen produced in the colon. So that's normal. So, you know, um, so if you see it, no, a lack of hydrogen rise in the colon, but you see a spike in you know, rise in methane or breath tests for that, you know, um, clearly shows that's the case. But in the small bowel, again, if you see that rise in, in methane at the you know, 20 or 40 minute mark on a breath test, you know, there's hydrogen producers there. Because otherwise it cannot, because that's what eating the substance first, they're right. eating the lactulose or the glucose or the fructose first. They produce hydrogen gas. That's eaten by the methane producing bacteria very quickly. And you get the spike in, in methane, not necessarily of hydrogen. So yes, you, you would actually have hydrogen producers there underneath there um, that you have to deal with too. And, and that's what B-Rate itself does not do. So I think it's arguably better for clonic um, methane issues than small bowel methane issues. So in terms of small bowel, large bowel, um, when we do the SIBO breath test, there's a time cutoff and there's some controversy about that. 
Um, is it 90 minutes? At, at one point, it was 100 minutes. Um, is it 120? I've talked to some prominent SIBO practitioners who always believe in doing a three-hour test because they don't trust that it might only be two hours. And yeah, now what I, happens? I, it, I always do three-hour breath tests. Oh, you always do? Check okay. for hydrogen methane. Okay. But I always do lactulose and fructose at a minimum, and often you, lactulose, fructose, and glucose. Are you? Are you, oh really? Are you checking yeah. for hydrogen sulfide as well? Is the trio smart available in Australia? It is. <sighs> I, I can arrange it for my North American patients, um, but I tend not to to use Cheer Smart so much. Um, I tend to stick with with the you know Quintron based you know um, testing for hydrogen methane for the most part. Why? Why? <laughs> um, I think I've seen some results, apparent discrepancies. Um, of even some people, the same 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 person, you know, a minute apart sending breath labs to sending the breath samples to different labs or even three um a couple went to like you know the more classic ones that do hydrogen methane and one went to the lab that does true smart and the level of hydrogen methane was was really accurate the same and, and the two normal labs normal labs but completely completely totally different in the trio smart one like like hundredfold like a lot different um and i've just seen that enough that i'm just a little bit hesitant to 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 know what to do with that um when when the levels of methane and hydrogen are like multitude lower on on that test consistently than i see on the other tests i'm a little bit like you think yeah, that has context. to do with the a way the gases are collected or do you know why Good question no i don't it's, it's just been enough that i've i've just been hesitant to go okay i'm just not fully going to tr trust this personally going to trust those results i'm going to stick with the, the sort of more conventional labs because they're the, the way that this shows up with the hydrogen methane seems consistent between them um interesting I'm comfortable with that and and you yeah. might be missing out on hydrogen sulfide though well i'm uh, i'm basing that on because I, uh, i'm testing lactulose often glucose and fructose yeah okay all um, three if, of those if they that's three, that's a lot of testing. You're you're talking about, especially if you're asking everybody to do a three hour test. That's nine hours of testing. It is. It is. But it's it's so much more accurate with the information you get. And and this is uh, uh, well, maybe two years ago now. I went through and said, okay, let's take the last hundred and thirty people we've we've suspected of SIBO and done breath testing for. Mm -hmm. If we just only did lactulose, only lactulose, how many people would we picked up with SIBO? And it was seventy three percent of those people we would have with SIBO we picked up with just lactulose if we did um fructose alone only fructose 85 percent of people really if we fructose did, is more accurate than lactulose I reckon it is and, and listen I we needs like further clear I, I don't have a uh my own like hospital setting where I can do like you know aspirin culture on, on people to ve to verify things so what I'm using is essentially that same criteria you know rise of 20 parts per million at, at 90 minutes whether that be with glucose or fructose because for me how, why are we defining SIBO by if it eats if it eats glucose it's SIBO but if it eats fructose it's not SIBO at the 20 minute mark like that's just stupid to me it's like <laughs> there are bacteria there eating sugar that aren't supposed to be there right um, whether eating glucose or fructose it's still bloody SIBO you know <laughs> like I, I don't understand where people are like oh no it's, it's only SIBO for the glucose or lactulose but if the same bugs are eating lactose it's no longer SIBO it's like of course it's SIBO because it's defined by the time where the gases are produced well not actually by the when it, that are actually when it comes to methane time doesn't even matter anymore right because no, it's emo right. and it could be in the large intestine that's right yeah so are um, you routinely doing stool testing as well to see if there's yes. methanogenes? Okay, you are. Yeah, so we're looking for methanogenes, which don't always show up on stool tests, I must I must say. Uh, breath right. testing is far better accuracy for picking up methane status, for sure. Um, but also looking for hydrogen sulfide gas producers on stool tests too. So let's say if I'm if I'm suspecting SIBO and it might be hydrogen sulfide is sort of the background as a possibility, we do lactulose, we do fructose, we do glucose. All right. The glucose and fructose completely normal, no sign of of you know excess, no 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 bump at all because there shouldn't be any bumps with hydrogen uh, or and methane's normal. Lactulose flat lines to three hours. All right. At this point, I'm thinking, okay, that this is possibly hydrogen sulfide SIBO. What does the the microbiome picture look like? Do I have elevated levels of hydrogen sulfide gas producers on that, um, or do so, I have? So those are the sulfur vibrio. Uh, yeah, and, and bilophila are two, okay. the two classic ones. You, you can also okay. have, you know, there's fusobacterium 
that right. would rarely be uh, involved, but can be. Okay. Um, and, and proteobacteria, some proteobacteria when overgrow can produce hydrogen sulfide too. So you'd be looking at those, but but the classic ones would be bilophila and the sulfur And not all stool tests sadly test for bilophila. It's it's harder to to find. And I think that's, I wouldn't use a stool test that doesn't tell me about bilophila, to be honest, because it's such a commonly overgrown hydrogen sulfide gas producer that if you don't test for it, you will never see it and you won't know. So which stool tests include bilophila? Um, <clears throat> the ones that do um, shotgun sequencing, like shotgun and genomic sequencing. So that would be things like Nirvana Biome, Cosmos ID in the States and Microba here in Australia. And they you know, microbes kids overseas too. They they will test for um, bilophila and um, the sulfovibrio. I know the sulfovibrio is on the GI map. I'm not sure. That one is a bit that. easier to come by for whatever reason. People have gone, oh, let's focus on the sulfovibrio. Yeah, bilophila is actually, in my experience, looking at you know thousands of, of, of stool samples is more often overgrown than the sulfovibrio because bilophila is a, it, its name gives away bilophila. It loves eating bile. It biles its thing. Um, so you tend to see it bloom and people who do like keto type diets or high fat diets, high, high saturated fat diets tend to have these major blooms of, of bilophila. Oh, interesting. Um, and it's just sad that you can't see it. So if you're doing a stool test that can't see bilophila, you have no idea that this diet is feeding, blooming these hydrogen sulfide and, gas producers. And, and the, there you are um, doing a low carb diet thinking you're starving your bacteria and you're actually feeding some of them. Feeding some of them. Yeah, that's right. Um, so to me, it's, uh, I would not do any stool test that does not do bilophila because you need to be able to look at that. So yeah, so I, I would look at that. Um, I'd also look for acetogens too. There are certain bacteria that we know that eat hydrogen and convert it through to acetate. So you're not going to get any breath, breath gases with that. Um, so you oh, have wait to a minute. Them which stool which ones too. are those? <laughs> they're, they're they're less characterized at this time point. This is this but, is a, a this is a new breaking news. <laughs> well, interesting. It's been around for a long time, but we, but but it just hasn't been discussed even huh. that, that much for some reason. You know, um, listen, even the the methane constipation stuff. I, I I moved house recently and I had to unpack. You know, sort through my papers in my garage. I had boxes and boxes of papers that I collected as part of my PhD. You know, they're all like, on the internet. Painstakingly given yeah. away. <laughs> I, I know well, that's why I gave them away. <laughs> <laughs> Most of them. But I came across one paper from the 1980s and they're and they looking at methane output and people were constipated. And they're like, hey, I think there might be a correlation here between people who are constipated have high methane output. And not only that, they they gave them tons of sulfur as a supplement. And these people shifted their hydrogen dynamics from methane to hydrogen sulfide from the sulfur. And, they're, and they got, and, they're, and their bowels sped up and they no longer had constipation. Yeah, and this is research in the 1980s. Wow. And you sort of forget that stuff like oh. that was, people were on it at that point, but some people wow. were, you know, because they're already looking at, you know, where does the hydrogen go? It's like, it can be methane or, or or hydrogen sulfide, and let's see if we can shift it between that. And they could, and effectively treat constipation by giving sulfur, and it, you know. So whether that's an approach we want to be doing, I don't know, because <laughs> hydrogen sulfide gas is pretty, not particularly great. So I don't think we want to be shifting people from tons of methane <laughs> to tons of hydrogen sulfide, but it's, it was interesting they were doing it. But one of the other pathways that hydrogen can go to, it can become acetate. So we have a number of groups of bacteria in our colon hydrenotrophs who eat hydrogen. So, you know, the methane producing bacteria are, or methane producing archaea, sorry, hydrogen sulfide gas producing bacteria. And then we have the, the acetogens, those that eat hydrogen and make acetate. And that's not a gas. So, and it's a lovely short chain fatty acid with anti-inflammatory effects. Right. So, um, that's obviously would be great if we could have more of that going on. In fact, I'm going to read a tangent here, but I just read a study in, in Japan recently, and they were looking at methane producing status and, and acetogens in, in, in this Japanese um, population. And I think it was only 7% of the Japanese population had methanogens present. Yeah. Whereas for, for Westerns, like it's like 90% of us have got methanogens <laughs> in our gut. And, huh. and Japanese, like their, their rate of constipation is very tiny. And their, a lot of their hydrogen went, goes to become acetate. In Japan, whereas for Westerners, that's more of a rare oh. situation. What yeah. is some so of the could, species that are acetogens? Uh, there is one of, the, one of the key ones we see is Blatia hydrenotrophica, I think, from memory. Whoa. Um, yeah, with his name, Never heard of that one. no, we again, you need to be using the right stool test to to see that one, like, and that where where you would have to use um shotgun metagenomic sequencing that you can get down to the species level to look to go what sort of blotty do you have and, and whether you've got that the acetate. Um, the ones that, that essentially consume hydrogen make acetate as a, as a consequence. And, and the cool thing is, too, that, that particular species can actually cross-feed fecalibacterium. 
So you end up have this, this beautiful relationship where we have this, this guy that eats hydrogen and it makes acetate and it shares somewhat acetate with um, Fecalobacter and Prophnitzii who makes butyrate with that shared acetate. You know, so to me, it's, like, oh, it's a beautiful relationship. And it's like, this is why we should be trying to encourage acetogenesis when, when we possibly can. Um, but essentially that occurs when the pH of the, of this in the colon is much lower. Yeah. So when we have a pH of like five and a half or less, we tend to have a much more, um, the, the capacity for acetogens to thrive, whereas they don't live in a, in a neutral pH that we tend to see in, in, in Westerners. Yeah. So you can also be looking at stool pH as, as one of the markers that can help indicate whether that that's because we're, that's we're, we're all drinking our acetogens. alkaline water to make ourselves healthier. <laughs> Well, I think it's a lack of fiber for the most part. Oh, you okay. don't eat plant foods, you don't eat fiber, you don't produce short-chain fatty acids, you don't get the change in pH. So essentially required. you're saying that Americans are full of shit. <laughs> well, Australians <laughs> and Canadians too, I'm going to say. And they often are. There's like there's often days worth of poo inside those, uh, of those populations. A lot of patients I work with have got days worth of poo that are there. You know, um, I heard one patient, I get into the... And this is one test I do for all patients, but I get them to do the bowel transit time test, the very low tech test. You eat some corn on the cob or some quinoa, black quinoa. You don't chew it. Write down exactly when you eat it. You write down when it starts coming out and when it finishes coming out in your poo. Yeah. But my champion one is, I think it was 20, 25 days before the corn started coming out. What? Yeah. And she was, she was only pooing every two or three days. So I knew it was going to be slow, but I oh had no idea gosh. it was going to be that slow. 25 days. Wow. Yeah. And you think how much fecal matter is, is loaded in that colon. Yeah. Constantly. Wow. And no wonder she was like you know, chronically unwell and, and felt horrific all the time. It's like, yeah, well, that's, that, that explains a lot of it there. And how, did, how did you treat that? Oh, this is a patient. This is a patient maybe. 10 years ago. So we're going back a fair while. I can't recall, but we certainly focused on, on trying to did speed you, up transit time. Did you and, ever get a colonic? Uh, listen, I think a colonic would have been helpful in the short term. Um, I'm a bit cautious around the potential impact on the colon from a long-term perspective, but right. I think as a, let's get, uh, you know, weeks worth of poo, sure, um, to get you feeling a bit, a bit better. Um, but I much prefer working from this way um, than than, than that way. Although I don't think the, the odd end, I think it's not going to be an issue, but I do think colonics where you're washing the colon a bit more, you're likely to have more changes to the microbiome as a, as a consequence. Um, do you think that some of the new generation of probiotics like Acromancy is now available? And I think that um, uh, fecal bacteria, Prodnitsky is starting. I, I think it's available. Probably not far off. I would reckon. Not far yeah. off. So these are like anaerobic strains that hadn't been available because of the difficulty of producing them. Yes. I, I, I've, I've read some that they may potentially be colonizers of the gut in some cases. Is that what have you what have you seen? Yeah, I can only speak clinically thus far with my patients who've taken the pendulum right. and right. pendulum glucose control. Yep. And I have not seen acromantia show up on any stool test yet when okay. my patients have taken it um, okay. when they did not have acromantia beforehand. I had high hopes. I was excited. I'm like, maybe we can because you're. we've tried to revive your acromantia population. It is extinct in your gut. You do not have it. Maybe we can we can recolonize with this supplement. Um but thus far, and listen, it's only been maybe 10 to 15 patients. So I'm not like okay. <laughs> saying no, it never does it. But right. I just have not seen him do it in my my in, in any of my patients thus far. Uh, and they've been taking the supplement at the same time they're doing the stool test even. And it hasn't even showed up on the stool test, which I've was, you know, slightly sad about. Because <laughs> I thought at least if they showed up when they take took it, it's a bit right. more positive around that. And maybe right. there's a chance of it sticking around, but um, right. they showed up when they're taking it so far. Interesting. Yeah. And this is we're, we're it's first generation acromanzio. So who knows? It maybe wasn't selected as as the core attribute was how how good it could colonize. Yeah. Um because I think there's some discussion around <clears throat> We know that, that in general, our current generation lactobacilli and bifidobacteria do not colonize in a specific degree um, in, in kids or adults. Um, yet, if we gave the same ones to breastfeeding mums or to, to mums, sorry, mums when they're pregnant, they can actually colonize that infant. Yeah, for life. So it's interesting. There's a window oh, where really? they, they could permanently colonize. Yeah, interestingly enough. Um, interesting. So, 
but but it won't in all the populations. But there's you know one study with uh, one type of bifidobacteria. Uh, it's I can't, it's code strain was maybe AH two one oh six or something. I can't I could be a little bit off with that one. It's been a few years since I read the study, but it did colonize in 30 percent of people. I think from memory for up to six months. You know, so it's like okay, if a strain is chosen where the main criteria is it can stay, and maybe they'll they'll, they'll like screen hundreds of different types of bifidobacteria to find one with that long lasting capacity to colonize yeah so uh, i would say that in the future we might have beef bacteria that can colonize we might have acromanzi or fecalibacterium that that can colonize i would just say perhaps at the moment we certainly don't have that in general with lactobacilli beef bacteria and at least in my experience we don't have that with acromanzia yet do we know specific prebiotics that can make certain bacteria uh flourish in the gut especially maybe ones that have uh you know, are really low. Yeah, for sure. And I think this is where where prebiotics shine is where you're trying to make specific changes to that ecosystem. Going, okay, well, you are, and this is something that I do in my practice all the time. Okay, you're I do analysis. Okay, you're low in bifidobacteria. You're low in acromanzia. Let's say hopefully they're there. They're just right. Maybe a thousandfold less than where you're happy to be, or a hundredfold less than what they should be. Right. Then yes, you could go. Okay, well, let's go. You know, inulin, inulin FOS, or otherwise known as oligofructose enriched inulin, very good at feeding both bifidobacteria and acromanzia, as well as fecalibacterium. So you have this substance that we can generally effectively use to target increased population of those three species without feeding other things for the most part in most people. Um, and then, you know, partially hydrolyzed guar gum, good for a range of butyrate producing species. Um, then we have galactooligosaccharides, which would be bifidobacteria and fecalibacterium for the most part. But GOS can also decrease hydrogen sulfide producers like the sulfurubrio and bilophila. And inulin FOS can also decrease um, bilophila populations too. So oh. we can use these tools to decrease levels of bugs we don't want and at the same time encourage levels we do want. And that's the thing I absolutely love about prebiotics is that, that capacity to Let's say you, your, your gut's overgrown with, with proteobacteria, you got large amounts of proteobacteria, prebiotic like lactulose, um, which I think kind of gets a bit of a bad name in the US because it's it's the, the food source for the, in the lactulose breath test, but it, it reduces the levels of proteobacteria brilliantly well in the colon. It, it is amazingly effective at doing so. Um, you've got studies showing that, and I can say from 20 years of practice <clears throat> of using lactulose, it effectively reduces proteobacteria populations in the gut. So you can use something that that is le increasing levels of good guys, decreasing levels of pathogens all at the same time. Yeah, so you're saying love. for uh, hydrogen sulfide, SIBO, FOS and GOS combination uh, might be part of an effective strategy. Yeah, you'd have to gauge what their um, you know, tolerance, because sometimes they will get one thing that hydrogen sulfide gas does is induces visceral hypersensitivity. So it makes the nerves in the colon more susceptible to gas-related pain and discomfort. So you have to kind of gauge where your patient's at with that, because you know if, if they're they've had H2S overgrowth for a long time, often visceral hypersensitivity can be intense. So you do anything that increases gas production in the colon, such as give GOS or inulin FOS, that gas discomfort will cause excruciating discomfort and pain so you have to kind of approach it differently depending where they're at with their symptoms and how far along they've had this h2s issue with because if you get them early on and they don't have that damage yet then yes because essentially what we should be getting when we when we ingest goss or inland foss is farting we should just get flattest if our gut's working beautifully just gas that's it but if we have issues there, um, where we have bloated, distension, pain, cramping, worsening constipation, there's something else underlying that that we need to, to deal with. And those tools may not be appropriate at this time point. And we might use other strategies. I mean, I think luckily with hydrogen sulfide gas producers, for the most part, bilophila is is a, a, it's a it's bile. Yeah. So you just like, okay, make sure they're not taking ox bile supplements that can <laughs> cause a massive bloom in, in hydrogen sulfide gas producers um, that most people, again, aren't aware of if you don't test for bilophila. But um, change, reduce saturated fat. That's a very quick and easy way to deal with bilophila well, for, for well, most people. But, but bile helps to break down any kind of fats. Why saturated fat? Well, it's a sulfur compound. When we're ingesting um, dairy fat, particular, but also other saturated fats, the sulfur content in our bile is higher for whatever reason. Oh. Um, and that feeds bilophila to a far greater degree so than you, you if you eat olive oil. So you want to reduce the bile and the sulfur? 
Yeah, but particularly, but yeah, yes, both, but particularly it's about changing the um, types of fat consumed. But I mean, sometimes it's overall fat too, but um, certainly you don't tend to see bilophila blooms from olive oil, avocados, and nuts and seeds, even if they're gorging on them, that does not happen. It is from dairy fat, butter, ghee, coconut oil, palm oil. Those are the things that will cause blooms of, of bilophila. So it's often easy to deal with that by by changing diet. Now, the, they can also be encouraged by um, supplements like like uh, chondroitin sulfate or glucosamine sulfate, um, again, that aren't always on people's radar, um, and and sulfur-based preservatives, synthetic ones used in processed foods. So we'll, we'll cut out those. Oh, oh you're so, saying those are, um, they contain sulfur, so they could- And they can feed hydrogen sulfide gas producers too. Yeah. So that thing, when people take chondroitin sulfate or glucosamine sulfate long-term, um, which is often the case for things like osteoarthritis, we have to be aware that they can negatively impact the colonic ecosystem by encouraging the growth of hydrogen sulfide gas producers. Yeah, time. there's studies showing that glucosamine sulfate reduces um, uh, uh, cardiovascular events by 30%. So it's a, it's a real uh, beneficial for cardiovascular as well. Yeah, it's interesting substance in that way. And I think it's just worthwhile keeping tabs on on how that individual person's ecosystem is, is responding to that dose of sulfur and whether they're having a bloom of hydrogen sulfide gas producers or not as a consequence of its use. Interesting. Well, what do you think about biofilm busting? Is that something that should be done in combating SIBO? Do bacteria that cause SIBO encase themselves in a biofilm? And does that make it like, for example, the methane producers tend to grow in the mucus? So is and that's sort of a biofilm. So does does that mean you need to um you know what? I talked to uh, Dr. Barr one time and he was saying that he thinks that taking acromancia, which eats mucus, um, that that makes it easier to get at the uh, methane SIBO. Oh, well, that's interesting idea. I mean, and certainly acromancia is one of the species in the gut that does indeed consume mucus. Um, Fecalobacterium does as well. But, and others, but um, right. What, now, what idea. about using coming back to what about using uh, agents that supposedly break up biofilms to make it easier to get rid of the? Um, yeah. Okay. I mean, my main concern here bacteria. is that beneficial bacteria live in biofilm too. Yeah, because I think this is a conception that some people have. That okay, guys live in biofilm, and the good guys are just playing around and, and don't. It's like <laughs> that's not true. They do too. So if we're giving something that is non-selective and breaks down biofilm of all bacteria, good and bad, then we're actually harming beneficial species too. Yeah, unless you've got a an agent that can selectively and only break down the biofilm of pathogens and leave the good guys alone. And that, you could you could research that before you, you, you marketed your product. You could do that research in vitro and go, hey, look, our, our biofilm busting product doesn't break down bifidobacteria or fecalobacterium or acromandia biofilm, but it does Klebsiella and E. coli. You know, wouldn't that be great? But they don't do that. Generally, it's like it's, it's, is, they list, is it, it kills any, kills bad guys, so therefore it must be fine for everyone to take. Is, is there any people. biofilm busting agent that you know of where where they have done that? Looked at that? Not in that kind of sense, but we do know that there are home medicines, for example, like oh, look at pomegranate husk. So that the skin of the pomegranate fruit, markedly antibacterial like, against pathogenic bacteria. Leaves bifidobacteria alone, and actually, and or actually, leave lactobacillus alone, encourages the growth of bifidobacteria. So you have a, a selectively acting substance that can that can break down the biofilm of pathogens. We've got clear data around that, both bacterial and fungal pathogens, but actually encourages levels of beneficial species. Yeah. So for me, it's like I'm going to use that. Thank you very much. You know, um, as as my tool to try where, to target. Where do you get overgrowth. pomegranate husk from, though? Well, but interestingly enough, listen, it's used in traditional Chinese medicine for 1,800 years. It's been okay. used in Ayurvedic medicine for over 2,000 years. It was used by Western herbalists and European herbalists up until probably about 100 years ago. Widely, um, it just dropped out in North American and Australian kind of practice in the last maybe 50 years or something like that. You can find it in old old herbals from the early 1900s. Talk Talked about using it too. Huh. I don't know why it dropped out, um, but you you could do a PubMed search of like pomegranate husk, um, you know, Pinica um, granatum is a botanical name, antimicrobial, or even Google Scholar it, and you'll get like hundreds of papers. It's so well researched as an antimicrobial agent. Yeah, you know, it, it, it kills worms, it kills giardia, it kills other uh, entamoeba, um, kills a range of fungi, kills pathogenic bacteria, but leaves good bacteria alone. And for me, I'm just gobsmacked that. that um, there aren't more 
people in industry who are like, oh my God, look at this something that's got like hundreds of research papers on it. Why don't we make a product with that? And listen, it, it's happened here in Australia. I mean, I've been talking about the wonders of pomegranate husk for 20, 20 years. And yet now there's like four or five different products with pomegranate husk in the market for clinicians to access. But oh, America okay. I... To, to, to go there. You, you can buy the powder. You know, you can buy organic pomegranate husk powder. And what I love too is oh, it's really? a waste product. It's like they're they're throwing it out anyway. So it's not no ecological concerns huh. about its use. We're not like finding some. Where, you know, where do you get herbs. organic pomegranate husk powder? Well, there's a there's a brand in the States called E-Sutras, E-S-U-T-R-A-S, that does organic pomegranate husk with huh. pomegranate skin powder, pomegranate peel. And it'll become more uh, as, as more people are aware of it, more people start requesting it, and then that'll make a change in terms of how, how accessible it is. But there's, you know, as I said, unlike some things where we worry about ecological concerns about harvesting golden seal or or coptis or something like that, because right. they're these rare, slow-growing plants. It's like this is the waste product of a huge industry that we can get buy organic pomegranates, we can get organic skins, and we can make medicine from that. And we should be given its its research base, its long, which should be used over thousands of years, and its selectivity of action. Yeah, I know you've talked uh, on other podcasts about being worried about some of the antimicrobials as potentially damaging the microbiome as well. Yeah, and, and th that came directly out of my, my PhD research, where we were looking at the impact of herbs on the microbiome. Um, and and I was like, oh, look at the herbs that, that cause harm. And it just occurred to me, what are these herbs doing to our, our good guys? And no one had done any research around that back in the early 2000s. So I was like, okay, I want to do this in vitro experiment of, of trying to grow these beneficial bacteria, expose them to, to diff, a range of different herbs that we use our antimicrobial herbs and see the impact. And it was it was fascinating to see because you know there were there were some substances like the berberine containing herbs like like golden seal or, or coptis chinensis that were amazingly good at killing bifidobacteria. They're good at killing bifidobacteria. Lactobacilli were more resilient, and but there wasn't a dose that you could kill bad guys without harming beneficial species. But there are other things like garlic that could kill candida and a range of pathogenic bacteria and completely leave good guys intact. Whereas if you got the dose of garlic up high enough, yeah, it would harm the, the good guys as well. So for me, that was like pretty pivotal um, research project that really changed my thinking around stuff going, okay, well, these herbs can cause harm. Maybe we should choose, choose the ones that are acting selectively. And that's really been the core of my, my practice since, you know, early 2000s when I, when I sort of um, did that sort of that, that research project. Um, and, and now we have clear, clear data on uh, some studies looking at long-term berberine use in, in blood sugar control. And yeah, yeah, listen, it brought down blood lipids and improved blood sugar control, but it, it hammered bifidobacteria populations, it decreased butyrate producing species, it decreased diversity of the ecosystem, and perhaps most surprisingly caused blooms of E. coli, Klebsiella, Citrobacter, and a range of proteobacteria bloomed with long-term use of berberine, um, which I think was fascinating because I was not expecting that. I was expecting, yeah, bifidobacteria and diversity are gonna go down with its use, long-term use, and probably back, um, butyrate producers with long-term use, the short-term use doesn't seem to have such a big impact. But I was not expecting blooms of harmful proteobacteria associated I, with- You know, I heard you say something like that. I, I I did a little data searching on berberine and there were some papers that even showed that it was beneficial for butyrate producers, that it has uh, uh, a beneficial effect. Yeah, and, and I think short-term versus long-term is one of the factors. And it's okay. there's a couple of studies out of China that were they used hundreds of participants, they're actually large studies, and with three months of use. Yeah, versus two weeks of use or four weeks of use. And, and yeah. the, the, then we saw kind of different patterns. We saw the blooms of proteobacteria, the, the clear degrees of, of um, bifidobacteria, and clear degrees of butyrate producers. And we yeah, may not see that decrease of butyrate producers in the short-term studies. Okay. So when we're talking about, when you're talking about berberine, there are different products on the market. And I was talking to one of the manufacturers and they said, look, when we're trying to use berberine as an antimicrobial, we're giving you berberine from all these different herbs mixed together. When we're using berberine as a blood sugar or it's actually berberine is like one of the few substances that's been shown to reverse atherosclerotic plaque in arteries um when we're using it for that purpose we're using berberine uh hydro um what's it called hydrochloride uh, hydrochloride yeah 
And, and that has a different action than berberine being derived from herbs. Do you think that makes a difference? No, I think it's got to do with <laughs> absorption. I think that's what's, what's key is that berberine derived from coptis. I think it's going to be the same as berberine hydrochloride from a, a, a action standpoint. I think it's whether it's absorbed or not. Uh, and berberine, the, the, the challenge with berberine is it is very poorly absorbed for the most part. Yeah, because our... I think our peak glycoprotein pump doesn't like it. So it's like gets into the cell and your enterocytes like, oh, I don't want this thing. It spits it back out into the to the, the lumen of the gut. So because of that, most of the bourbon you ingest stays in the colon where it interacts with the ecosystem and long-term causes causes harm to that ecosystem. Um now there are ways of probably trying to to enhance the absorption of berberine, and there are some companies that have focused on that, where they could combine it with you know phosphatidylcholine, um, same way they make they do with turmeric or boswellia. They can right. combine or green tea extract. They can combine it with phosphatidylcholine, which increases absorption. Uh, clinically, I've used black pepper or piperine to improve the absorption of of um, berberine as well to get it out of the gut, to get into the bloodstream. For me, I'm using it to to treat um, dental abscess infections where I want the antimicrobial action of berberine, but I don't want it in the gut. I want it in the bloodstream. And piperine turns off um, um, peak glycoprotein pumps in enterocytes. Um, so you actually end up with a ton more berberine in your bloodstream if you take it with, with piperine. You know, so there are ways of, of modulating it so you get increased absorption and decreased um, colonic damage with its use. But I think uh, it's it's imperative that we're aware of the fact that it does harm the microbiome with long term use too, because we might have options. Like if we go, all right, berberine is one way of controlling blood sugar, but so is nigella, nigella sativa, black seed. Tons of studies on that, showing very similar results, and you don't get the, the microbiome harm with black seed. Yeah, so I'm like, there's often often choices with, with atherosclerosis. I came across a study that used, I think it was pycnogenol and go to cola showing clearance of, of of plaque artery plaque from from with long-term use and again okay i'm much more comfortable using that for for months to years than i am berberine i don't mind using berberine for for two weeks um no issue at all for for treating giardi or something i don't mind using for two weeks or i don't mind again treating a dental abscess where i'm giving it with with or other systemic infection with black pepper to enhance the absorption for in 10 to 14 days but i'm really cautious with any more than 14 days use um and we don't necessarily know at what point the we we get that sort of more substantive um microbiome harm with with bourbon we can just say the studies that looked at three months definitely showed it um the damage that was done so yeah for me it is i'd certainly i'd be cautious that it's something to recommend on a daily basis for for years such a substance yeah i haven't seen that but <laughs> Yeah, it will be interesting yeah. if you if you did yeah. shotgun management sequencing with all your your patients oh, okay. and post. So you do that yeah. beforehand, do it after three months, right. and see the impact. You know, I can just say that I've seen it with my patients, and I've right. seen the, the research is, is clear with long term use. There are certain patterns that you you start seeing with it that are not positive. You just mentioned turmeric. Um, I've been using curcumin, like a uh, you know highly absorbed form of curcumin, to help with some patients with visceral hypersensitivity. I, I've seen yeah. a couple of papers on that. What do you think about that? Yeah, love it. I love it. I, and I use it heaps for that same purpose too. Um, I use Iberogast lots for that. I okay. guess it's a herbal combination. Right. For the reason it's hard to come by in the US, but in Australia and in Europe, it's much yeah, easier. Yeah, somehow for a while it wasn't available at all. And yeah. something happened with the manufacturer. Or I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, we had constant access to it here, so I'm not sure what happened overseas. But as something that that effectively decreases visceral hypersensitivity with patients, yeah, even because I think so. I've got some patients who have IBS and they go, "Oh, I tried a baragas for two weeks and it didn't decrease my symptoms." I'm like, "Well, yeah, we're lucky if it decreases symptoms, and a lot of people will decrease bloating and distension and you know and abdominal pain, cramping, sure, but we're using it to decrease visceral hypersensitivity and that takes you know three plus months of use to see that kind of benefit and, say, and i use it all the time with with you know a well-absorbed turmeric you know phytosome extract so that they're and usually within three to six months there's a massive improvement in their visceral hypersensitivity which means that their diet can be expanded they can have more onions and garlic and legumes right. and other things that nurture a wide range of beneficial microbes they may have had to cut out because their their gut was so sensitive to gas interesting um so so some people might be able to tolerate a much lower level of gas. So it's not oh, just about totally. getting the gas down. It's, yeah. 
Yeah, that's it's very clear from the IBS research that, yeah, there is some research showing that people with IBS have produced more gas, but there's more research showing that they're sensitive to the gas being produced. Um, and they I always tell this example to my patients, but they, they put these special balloons up their butts and they pump up those balloons and people with IBS will complain of pain when the balloon is this full, whereas normal people with balloon is that full before they get the same degree of pain and discomfort because right. the nerves are just hypersensitive. And it, they can be pretty extreme. If, you, if you take the population from West Hollywood or not, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, uh, so what do you think about soil-based probiotics? Ah, listen, I'm, I've been organic gardening for over 30 years. I love it. And I organic garden all the time. I'm out in nature and I'm drinking creek water, you know, I'm exposing <laughs> myself to lots of wild microbes. And I think- Are you? You drinking important. creek water? I do drink. Well, not from like a dirty source, obviously, but from <laughs> a, when I'm out in the rainforest and it looks clean, yes, I'll drink creek water. I was out, out in Canada, up in the Highland Rocky Mountains, where again, I don't think people were peeing and pooing upstream and I'm happy drinking creek water. <laughs> and I wouldn't even worry if it was like healthy people peeing or pooing, to be honest. It's just like- <laughs> If people who don't have such healthy gut ecosystems or have GRD or something, I don't want to drink their their downstream water. But <laughs> uh, it is an interesting way of picking up microbes from the environment anyway. Um, you know, and I think we, we even know that uh, interesting, enough, even having a more diverse garden, if you have a, a wider diversity of plants growing in your garden, um, you have a more diverse gut ecosystem as well. You know, so there, there are, we're certainly always picking up microbes from the environment, generally it's temporary. Reserves. Oh, so I'm really referring to spore-based probiotics. Well, I mean, you are talking about soy based ones too, but I suppose I'm just taking the, the, the I, conversation I, a bit broader. I, I, yeah. yeah, I think soil, but spore based are often referred to as soil based. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. Is and it, and are, I think are they the same or not? Well, I don't think all soil based ones will be spore formers. Okay. For sure. Okay. No. But spore but are certainly, soil based. Okay. I see. But certainly the ones that people are marketing are often marketing, at, they are spore based and, and originally probably derived from soil as well. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a growing body of, of evidence building around the use, which I'm really happy to see. I think they're overhyped initially compared to the evidence base, and I think that's changing as more evidence comes on, on board. So, I mean, for me, it's always on evidence. If there's evidence that this product is safe and efficacious, whether it comes from soil or it comes from the skin of lychees or it came from some healthy Swedish person's gut or another Swedish person's breast milk, like the retried DSM-17938 came from someone's breast milk, you know, for example. I'm totally happy to use it if it's safe and efficacious. And again, I don't mind if it's coming from soil or or or, or whatnot. Um, yeah, I just think that the, the evidence base for them as a class compared to Bifidobacteria lactobacilli or even Saccharomyces is, is just a lot less at the moment. Yeah. Um, right. But, you know, there's research on uh, Bacillus coagulans, GBI 306086, I think is from memory is its code name strain name that for rheumatoid arthritis yeah and there's no other probiotic with, with good data for rheumatoid arthritis so i will definitely use that in that condition for sure you know so i think it, if it has something that's unique or better evidence-based i would totally use them in irrespective of where they came from right yeah um, I, I think just sometimes the the generalizations out there are sometimes are a bit much of like oh it comes from the soil therefore we should all be ingesting it it's like well what soil where which part of the world you know soil would be different elsewhere the assumption that something that lived lived in garden soil is going to be very happy in your gut growing at 37 degrees in quite a different environment than than soil, you know, can be a bit much too if you're expecting it to be permanently recolonized. But we know that sometimes you can pick up bugs from the soil and, and have them stay for long periods of time. And we know that people who are who are active gardeners in summer, they they can have a tremendous number of increased microbes, some people, compared to what it is in winter when they're not actively gardening, you know, where you have temporary visitors of these soil-based um soil-derived microbes as well. You mentioned a specific probiotic that helps with rheumatoid arthritis. The GI MAP stool test, which we tend to do a lot, has a section where they have um, uh, bacteria that may be correlated with autoimmune conditions. And there's a certain amount of data showing that those specific bacteria uh, that are, you know, there's a certain level of correlation with specific autoimmune conditions. And so if those bacteria are overgrown, you know, the idea is maybe if I could reduce that bacteria, maybe we could have some benefit. What do you think? Do you think there's any, um, where are we? Is it still pretty speculative? Oh, I think it's a, it's a bit speculative, but, you know, we're, we're, we see disease associations 
<clears throat> microbiota, certain patterns with certain disease states um, all the time. And, and, and I can say, I'm a clinician too. So I'm a researcher, clinician, I see patients. So I, I, I see what works and what doesn't work. And I'm happy to prescribe things that that work clinically too, you know, um, that haven't even researched necessarily yet either. So I'm okay with, with you know, some not relatively novel stuff of going, okay, there's a study that shows that, you know, low acromanzia or low bifidobacteria in eczema is, a, is, a, is seems to be a, a common pattern. Um, and I go, okay, well, I will increase bifidobacteria in my eczema population. And clinically, you see good results by doing that in terms of decreased allergies and decreased reactivity, you know, so I will, I will, I will base my decisions along that, that too. Um, yeah. So I, I mean, I think, yes, there'll be a degree of speculative that's there, but you might have to, again, trace that, that back. I, I'm not familiar with all the microbes that they associate with increased risk of autoimmunity. And right. you might just want to double check that. I'm going, okay, well, do I concur by my, my view of the, the connection sure. between those ones? Yeah. yeah. You know, um, yeah, but I'm open to that that approach in general yeah. of of the, the different disease associations associated with diseases with different dis, you know microbiota patterns and how we can modify that to, to change the disease process because that, that's something I do every day in clinical practice and see the cool. results of. Great, uh, awesome discussion, Jason. Thank you so much. Um, I could ask you a hundred more questions, but I appreciate your time and I respect it. So, tell our listeners and viewers about the things you have to offer, the probiotic advisor, your courses, where can they go? Yeah, so we set up the probiotic advisor as a independent, um, evidence-based um, access point, accessible information around probiotics. So we can work at, so you can take industry out of the way, out of the equation and go, what does the evidence say about this probiotic strain for this condition? So it's a searchable database where you can type in a condition or a product and you can work out what the research says it should be used for. Um, and that's been going for a number of years. And that's one of my babies that came out again of, of wanting people to be as evidence-based when possible and choosing to get, we really wanted to improve outcomes with patients. That's where it boils down to. And if we, we can do that by using evidence to go, okay, this product strain works for this condition. This one doesn't use one that works and don't use one that doesn't, you know, and don't even just guess, maybe it'll work just to use the one that works. Um, and I also offer a range of courses on uh, through the, the microbiome restoration center as well. And I'm mostly targeting clinicians, you know, um, because I love teaching clinicians around um, gut health and, and microbiome restoration. So we have you know, two two general courses, um, you know, like natural and functional medicine approaches to gastrointestinal conditions, and then another sort of 10-week course, which is advanced microbiome manipulation, which is all about some of the concepts we talked about today, but about, you know, um, different testing approaches and in you know, different labs and interpretations, but also how to modify ecosystems in beneficial ways in a, in a way that for me, I think it came out of my PhD looking at the wonders of the microbiome. You know, I, I've been integrated or, or indoctrinated in the wonders of the microbiome from, you know, the late nineties when I started my first reading around the microbiome um, is, is choosing therapeutic approaches that minimize harm from the microbiome perspective, which is an old naturopathic concept of first do no harm. And I think if we have choices of, of, of tools, to, we can choose berberine or we can choose pomegranate husk. I'm going to choose pomegranate husk. If I can get the same outcomes, Without the negative, you know, outcomes on on microbiome perspective, I will choose that first. So that underlying philosophy runs through my my kind of teaching is to optimize ecosystem and minimize agents that cause harm or interventions that cause harm as much as we can. And also being aware, like I had a patient last week who a ketogenic diet for child with epilepsy made a huge difference, huge difference to like having like daily seizures that were like you know uncontrollable to having mild seizures daily um, from going keto and diet. But our focus will be on our, how do we maintain your ecosystem health when you're on this diet that you need to be on because it's really helpful for you? How do we make sure you're still feeding your beneficial bacteria? And how do we prevent the bloom of harmful species that over the long term could potentially actually be counterproductive to what we're trying to achieve in terms of neurological inflammation? You know, so I think always having that that as a how do we optimize microbiome health um, for this person and how do we choose agents that are most likely to do that as, as at the forefront of our minds as clinicians. That's great. And if uh, listeners want to work with you. Uh, yeah, I, I do see patients through Gould's Natural Medicine, which is my clinic down in Hobart, although I'm not in Hobart now, um, but I see patients internationally. I'm, I'm completely online these days. All right. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you so much. Thank you for making it all the way through this episode of the Rational Wellness Podcast. For those of you who enjoy listening to the Rational Wellness Podcast, 
I would certainly appreciate it if you could go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and give us a five-star ratings and review. That way, more people will discover the Rational Wellness Podcast. And I wanted to let everybody know that I do have some openings for new patients so I can see you for a functional medicine consultation for specific health issues like gut problems, autoimmune diseases, cardiometabolic conditions, or for an executive health screen or, and to help you promote longevity and take a deeper dive into some of those factors that can lead to chronic diseases along the way. Um, and that usually means we're going to do um, some more detailed lab work, stool testing, sometimes urine testing. Um, and we're going to look at uh, a lot more details to get a, a better picture of your overall health from a preventative functional medicine perspective. So if you're interested, please call my Santa Monica White Sports Chiropractic and Nutrition Office at 310-395-3111 and we can set you up for a new consultation for functional medicine. I'll talk to everybody next week.